All right, so joining us now is Professor Mark Van Hagen of Arizona State University and also the Dean of the Philosophy Department at the Free Ukrainian University in Munich. Welcome, thanks for joining us. Thank you, nice to be here. So the first thing I wanted to ask is if you could just tell us a little bit about the project you've been doing. Um, as I understand it, it's about Ukrainian diplomats and trying to educate them through partner universities in Europe and the US. Well, it's not so much about just educating Ukrainian diplomats as it is about helping Ukrainian diplomats educate us in the West about Ukraine. Because one of the problems I face as a historian of Ukraine um, is uh, a constant sort of laziness or, or just ignorance on the part of even my historian colleagues who, who work on Russian Eastern Europe about Ukraine's history and, and, and most people still sort of have an automatic default to, to Russia and the Soviet Union and, uh, and that's true What's true for the academic world is, uh, I think, as, as true, if not more true, for the diplomatic world. So American, European diplomats, um, I don't think, are as aware of Ukraine as they should be. So, uh, so that's one side of it. The other side of it is after the end of the Soviet Union, the Russian foreign ministry inherited all of the sort of intellectual apparatus of the Soviet foreign ministry, which means all these institutes of international relations and area studies institutes, the, the famous institute of USA in Canada, in Moscow, all of those were in Moscow. So Kiev had a slightly better situation than some of the other successor states in that they had a United Nations representative since 1944. Which was something Stalin negotiated right. for, correct? Yeah as part of the Yalta agreements and the agreements with the Churchill and, and Roosevelt. But, but that was a very small staff of 60 and, and, and they mostly only worked with the United Nations organization. So they only had multilateral uh, relations. They never had any bilateral relations. So, so Ukraine really is at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis Russia as are the other post-Soviet states. But Ukraine, of course, is the biggest one. And I think if Ukraine doesn't succeed at what it's doing in, in getting itself put on the map again, um, the other ones don't have much hope either. So my idea was to uh, get uh, advanced, advanced students in international relations and maybe beginning diplomats to spend a, a semester or a year in an American, Canadian or European uh, u university in, with international relations programs or with some area studies institutes or diplomacy institutes. Um, Diplomatic Academy in Vienna comes to mind, uh, Georgetown in, 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 in Washington, uh, and um, again, have these people from Ukraine develop relationships with counterparts in the West who then might come teach in Kiev at some point or uh, at least get to know more about Ukraine and help Ukraine's sort of international image raise awareness of, of, of Ukraine's contemporary situation, its history, its, its rich culture and it's complicated past uh, because I, I think partly people say Ukraine is so complicated I would just rather deal with Russia and, and, and that's, uh, you know, that's, that's not a way of running the world and, and so I, I'm hoping and I had a very uh, a useful set of meetings with uh, some former diplomats, um, ambassadors, foreign ministers who formed the Ukrainian Foreign Policy Association and they're very keen on hooking us up with the Kiev Institute of uh, International Relations and the Lviv Institute of International Relations and finding candidates to send uh, as soon as next year if we can get this off the road. And then there's a lot of other programs that are happening now uh, with State Department and, and German Foreign Ministry but it's a kind of piecemeal and um, there, there doesn't seem to be any much follow-up and, and build community building out of this which I, I think uh, if we do this right uh, it, it could help. So my idea is to spread these Ukrainians uh, with interest in foreign relations around all sorts of you know everything from Stanford to Harvard to uh, Columbia to Georgetown to European universities and and get people to know uh, that there is a Ukraine that's different from Russia that's you know uh, that's got its own interests and, and that's um, worth getting to know. And I mean, these are universities that you've taught at and studied at respectively, so that's there. I mean, what's been the response from Western partners? I mean, it seems like Ukraine is much more on the map for Western countries than it was before. What have people been saying to you in the West when you've kind of floated this idea? Some universities have already built in programs where they can assign a slot to Ukrainians, for, such as my university, Arizona State University, has a McCain Institute. John McCain is my senator from Arizona. And he, he was is, just in Odessa this he week. He was just in Odessa. He's a big, he, this is his third trip to Ukraine, I think, this year, I was told. So he's a, a very big supporter of Ukraine's independence. And uh, 
I, I, I was glad that his institute at my university offered the first concrete slot for a Ukrainian for next year. Uh, Georgetown, the new dean of Georgetown, is a former student of mine, also very interested in this. And of course, the, my, my old home, uh, Columbia University, before I moved to Arizona, um, uh, also has Valery Kuczynski teaching there, who uh, is a former permanent representative of Ukraine to the United Nations, who I got a teaching uh, at Columbia while I was still there. And he uh, has put me in touch with all of these guys and, and sort of helped me work out this idea uh, that this would help uh, Ukrainian diplomatic corps uh, build, rebuild itself and, and, and build itself to a new level. In Arizona, you've been very active with veterans, with different projects on campus. Um, what sort of projects have those been? Yeah, that's a, I, I, about uh, three years ago, I wrote to my president uh, and said that I've been having lots of interesting conversations with students who turn out to be veterans, American veterans of our recent wars, mostly Iraq and Afghanistan. Turns out we have almost 4,000 such veterans on our campus. We're a very large university. And my idea was, uh, you know, since I teach about histories of war, and I, I want my students to understand what the, the lived experience of war is like as much as possible, um, I, I, I usually have them read memoirs or, or diaries or some kind of correspondence from World War I or World War II, but it occurred to me that here I've got 4,000 people who actually have been to war who can tell students face to face if they are interested in learning what that kind of experience is about. And so my, my, my office has been designed to allow uh, veteran students to tell their stories of war, uh, however they want to do that. And, and we've branched out more than just sort of official storytelling, but we have music therapy, we have art therapy, we have writing classes, we have um, book, uh, book reading groups with veterans kind of ex ex exchanging their views. And we, we try to um, remind the non-veteran students that we are at war. We have been at war at least since 9-11 and probably longer. And, and it's easy for Americans to forget that war because it's only 1% of our population that typically is fighting our endless wars abroad. Um, and, and the sort of response, uh, as famous uh, words of George Bush is, go shopping. Uh, that's how we're supposed to be patriotic and, and, and do our duty uh, and, and during the wartime. And that's, I, I really think that's a very inadequate and, in fact, probably criminal response to that. I, mean, I think people should be aware of what we're sending our, our students, our, our, our boys and girls abroad to do. And uh, since uh, the occupation of Crimea and the outbreak of war in eastern Ukraine, um, I, I, I realize I have a new uh, arena for, to learn about living with war and, and, and it's been a, an amazing experience coming here uh, with just a year and a half of, of war going on, how, how war has transformed Ukrainian society and all the kinds of volunteer activities that have uh, emerged from, from Ukrainian society that's been very, very impressive. I've been meeting with uh, veterans, uh, groups, that, groups that are helping veterans and soldiers, uh, treating their traumas. Um, many of them with diaspora help, but a lot of them are just uh, Ukrainian uh, native people who are, who, are, who are volunteering their time and their energy, their money, whenever they have some, to uh, supporting their army and their, their soldiers. And, uh, and I, I, um, I went, you know, I, I've been learning about how, how the arts here in, in Ukraine are reflecting hybrid war. With, I went last night to a, a punk concert, something unusual for me. With, with Serhii uh, Jadan uh, uh, talking and singing about, about the war and, and how it's uh, changed uh, Ukrainian society. So I, I hope to, you know, to bring my interest from uh, our own American uh, veterans to, uh, to, to, to Ukraine and share with the people here what, what we've learned, but also I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming I'm going to learn a lot more from Ukrainian efforts right now since the uh, war is a lot closer to Kiev than it is to Arizona and even to Washington, D.C. Uh, well, and it's relevant because I mean, you come from a military family yourself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you were an army brat for a little yeah, while. Yeah, army air force brat. Yeah, I was brought up in on military bases, so it's not it's not a foreign world to me. Uh, I've never served in the military, so I, I can't say I, I have that kind of experience. But I but I have a respect for for military people and their and their sacrifices and and their uh, you know their their service and and I uh, I think that's uh, something that. Ukrainians are starting to relearn. I mean, Americans have you know, some kind of a tradition of that. We, we, we say thank you for your service to our veterans. We have all kinds of free things that we give away to veterans in restaurants and 
concerts. But it seems like a key part of it is the discussion of what actually happened and the effect it yeah. happens to people. Because it's one thing to honor people and yeah. say, we honor right. you, but right. we don't want to hear yeah, about exactly. it. Exactly. That's and most people are, are, are happy to just say, we honor you, and that's enough. They don't really want to know. And, and I think um, one of the things I've learned in all this veterans activity is that we, we, we as human beings, uh, I think this is true of Ukrainians as well as Americans, are taught how to read, we're taught how to write, we're even taught how to speak up to a certain point. But we, it's assumed that we know how to listen uh, from childhood. And, and listening is almost as hard, I think, as all those other things. And, and, and it takes a lot of skill. And, and you can listen to someone and, and, they, and you don't hear what they're saying. And, and I think what, one of the things I've been trying to, to, to teach my students to do with, through these oral history courses and, and so listening to the veterans is, to learn how to listen to someone and to learn how to listen you need to know things and the more you know the better you can listen and better you can understand yeah, so that's yeah so anyway journalists you know are, are, are you know sort of prime teachers of how to listen because you guys have to listen all the time and the, yeah well well good journalists know how to listen <laughs> and just like good professors should know how to listen too but I don't think most of our my colleagues do know how to listen they, they know how to talk but they don't know how to listen well and I think it's a challenge in Ukraine moving forwards you know not also just not to honor these people many of whom very young sent yeah. to fight in the East but to actually listen to them and to listen to what they're saying about what needs to be changed right. um, to turn in a slightly different direction I know you've been looking a lot at the history of the Ukrainian People's Republic after World War One um, for most of the people in the West, this is completely off the radar. A lot of people don't even know that Ukraine had this brief few years of independence, um, and it's a very vivid memory for here. But what I found very interesting that you've spoken about is how there's a lot that was done then that was done very well, and that Ukraine doesn't need to repeat now, though it's trying to do it from scratch. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. What sort of things were done well? Well, one of, one of the things I, I think, uh, first of all, I, I like to say that I, I teach, the, this is what I teach when I go to Munich every summer, to teach Ukrainian students who, are, who all have degrees from Ukrainian universities, but who have chosen for a variety of reasons to live in Germany for the time being, and uh, either to make a better life for themselves when they come back to Ukraine, or maybe not to come back to Ukraine. And I think a lot of them are weighing over in their minds whether they're going to come back or not. In fact, one of the questions that kind of haunts me from the beginning of that course was one of the students said, you're teaching us about all of this stuff that happened a hundred years ago, these revolutions and wars. And so what's going to, can you tell us what has changed in a hundred years that would make us want to go back to Ukraine today? And I said, that's, that's a kind of question that no American student ever asked me and no other student has ever asked me. And it really kind of put a new stake on what I was teaching. And, and, I, and I guess I, I, I see that period, 1914 to 22, very similar to today right now, where you know, there's a lot of uh, threats to Ukraine. Um, there's a Ukrainian national movement that's still, uh, that's getting stronger, but that, that, that is still rejected by Russians on the one hand, at least certain kind of Russians. And, and, and there's a civil war, there's a external intervention, there's all kinds of international involvement. What, what I wrote, related to the my diplomatic project, I, I, I uh, wrote a paper about the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, again, kind of a forgotten treaty on a forgotten front. Um, and the first treaty, uh, I mean, we mostly know that the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was signed with the Bolsheviks in March 1918. But the first treaty was signed a month earlier with the Ukrainians, with the Central, uh, with the Ukrainian National Republic, uh, the Ukrainian People's Republic. And it was negotiated by five young men none of whom had extensive diplomatic service. They all came out of the student movement and the soldiers movement of 1917. They'd all served in the Ukrainian Central Rada and the General Secretariat, so they had actually more experience than any of the Bolsheviks who showed up in brest But they didn't have diplomatic training. But they knew how to behave with the Germans and the Austrians and the Hungarian, or the Turks and the Bulgarians, whereas the Bolsheviks sent this kind of theatrical delegation of a, a terrorist who had assassinated some Ministry of Interior official and a, a sailor and a, a soldier and a worker. And the Germans and the Austrians just looked at them and said, this is a serious delegation? No. And, but the, the, the Ukrainians came and they wore their tucks and tails, they dressed nicely, they behaved, and they, and they made a good case. They were united against the Bolsheviks and also somewhat against the Central Powers. And they got these Central Powers, the Germany, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Turkey, to recognize Ukraine for the first time. Actually, they had gotten recognition from France and Britain a month before. 
Um, uh, but, but this was the first major sort of lasting one. And then the Germans agreed to help save uh, this Ukrainian government from the Bolsheviks. When the Bolsheviks attacked Kiev in, uh, in early 1918 and sacked Kiev for 10 days, uh, bombed it, bombed Khrushchevsky's house, and, and had a wave of terror here for, t for about two weeks before the Germans and the Austrians kicked them back out and reestablished the, the, direct, uh, the, the National Republic and then, of course, replaced them with the Skoropatsky uh, uh, government a, little, a, a couple of months later. But the, the fact that these five guys, who are almost all under 30, with no diplomatic experience, could you know, unite uh, around a set of issues that they wanted to press with the Central Powers, and, and, the, and they realized the Central Powers were all desperate for peace. They all were, there were starvation in Vienna, there was starvation in Budapest, there was riots in Berlin. So the Germans and the Austrians needed peace. The Ukrainians certainly needed peace, the Bolsheviks needed peace. And so the, the Ukrainians were very skillful at getting their state on the map for the first time uh, in a serious way. And, uh, and, I, and I think that's a good lesson that even in all that chaos and all that dissension and, and the divisions among the Ukrainians themselves, they were able to pull together you know, when, it, when it counted and, and get something important done that, again, well, I think that that's what Ukraine needs now. I mean, it's presenting a European yeah. face. It's yeah. showing, you know, worried European countries that right. they support peace, yeah. despite what's right. said to the contrary. Um, you know, and it's just instilling a certain amount of confidence in getting Ukraine represented. Yeah. No, this goes, you asked the same question. I mean, I said this the, the first time I taught this last a summer, two, a few summers ago, um, there was a question of whether Germany had, what, what, what Germany had by way of any kind of obligation to Ukraine. They said, well, first of all, Germany invaded Ukraine at least twice in the 20th century, occupied it you know, brutally. Uh, but, but beyond that, Germany also helped Ukraine get on the map with, with the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and, 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 and other uh, diplomatic adventures. So I, I, I think, you know, I wanted to make a point that Ukraine became a state largely on the initiative of Ukrainian national movement, on the, on the, on the initiative of Ukrainian national activists but that it, no state, and certainly not Ukraine, ever came into existence on its own. It needed allies, it needed Germany or the Entente powers. Poland is a good example. I mean, Poland was not a state until 1918 either. Without French, British, um, uh, and American eventual support, there would be no Poland today. And, and that's, you know, again, the Polish national movement was very important, but without that kind of wartime sort of Competition. Well, with countries yeah. coming together. Well, and, and again, right now, you know, there's another war, and I think the war has put Ukraine back on the map. I mean, even uh, me, I, I, I have studied Ukrainian history now for probably 15, 20 years, and most of my Russian history colleagues think it's a kind of a, a strange hobby I have when I have nothing else to do serious like Russian history. And then this January, I got invited to testify with Tim Snyder from Yale University at, 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 at Congress about, the, about Ukraine and the war with Russia. And I, and that's not too often that my Russian history colleagues get to do that. And I, I don't think I'm going to get to do that again too soon. But, but the fact that you know, Putin put Ukraine on the map is not a good thing. But you know, we take what we can get. But it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. I think that's a great and, and, note. And I think to... Ukrainians have taken a wonderful opportunity. I can say that the wave of volunteerism in, in this country is, I think, only matched in recent memory by solidarity in Poland. And, and I think, you know, that's, if that's not European, and I think Poles are, understand that too, and I think Poles are probably the best friends that Ukraine has right now. Poland as a government and Polish people, because they know what, what having what it's Russia like, what it's as a neighbor. Through. All right, well, I think I'm gonna end you on that, but I think this idea of, you know, as difficult as everything has been, the fact that these events have gotten Ukraine on the radar of other countries and created an opportunity is a powerful message yeah. I want to keep in mind. Exactly.